Okay, so my name is Aaron Card. I'm a postdoc at Scott Edwards Lab. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about a portion of my dissertation work I did with Todd Casto uh, at the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, and the topic will be the genomic basis of conversion island phenotypes in oak strictures. So conversion evolution, at least in my opinion, is one of the more compelling lines of evidence for the, the power that natural selection has to create biodiversity worldwide. Um, and historically, it was thought to be relatively rare um, and highly improbable, but increasingly we were finding many examples, both at the phenotypic level and also at the genotypic level, of conversion evolution, including some of the more well known ones here. Today, I'm going to talk to you about conversion evolution in a new group of organisms, that of a wide, uh, widespread New World snake genus, uh, Boa. So Boa is pretty well known to the general public, I think. But when you go down to Central America, to places like Belize and Honduras, and you get out of these near offshore islands, uh, you find that the boas on these islands uh, tend to be uh, significantly reduced in overall body size, indicated here. You also see differences in cranial facial morphology between island and mainland populations, and also across different islands that we've measured. And there's a whole range of other traits that I'm kind of glossing over here including clutch sizes, coloration, even the deposition of fat, that appear to vary between island and mainland populations across Central America. So previous work has deduced that this seems to be adaptive to these, the limited resources that exist on these, these tiny islands. Some are very, very, very small. And people have brought some of these snakes into, the, into uh, captivity and see that these traits persist. There seems to be some sort of genetic component to it as well. So what we were interested in doing during my, during my PhD was using this system to try to understand uh, the genomic basis of virgin island phenotypes. So today I'm going to talk to you about kind of three aims of the project that we, that we went through. Uh, first is basically understanding, is there a convergence to begin with? You know, we see it across islands, but are those islands truly independent from one another? Second, um, can we assess the frequency of natural selection and genomic convergence? And then lastly, uh, What's interesting to me is if we can detect instances of, of links between genotype and phenotype and, and explore whether those are converging across these different island systems. And the approach we took to do a lot of this work was, uh, was genetic. Um, so we collected island and mainland sampling from the core of Central America, primarily from Belize and Honduras, including um, uh, island populations in, in Belize here, too, and also a couple islands here in Caes Cachinos off the coast of Honduras. Uh, we also we collected high-density rat seed data, so about 200,000 markers throughout the genome. Uh, and then for a subset, we also did some whole genome resequencing data, which gives us the ability uh, to, to look at regions that, that code for proteins and, and so on and so forth, as you see towards the end. So just to, to lay out the first point here, uh, trying to understand whether there's truly uh, independence between these different island populations. One thing we did right off the bat was use our high density red seed data set to just estimate a, a population level tree uh, for these, these populations using assignments that we deduced based on previous phylogeographic work. And a couple of patterns stand out, one being this non monophyletic relationship between these two key populations or island populations of Belize, which kind of suggests that that perhaps uh, dwarfism evolved independently on these two islands. You can contrast that with Chaos Cuchinos down here, uh, where we, we see a strong evidence for a monophyletic uh, population there. But of course, SNAP doesn't really take into account things like subsequent admixture or gene flow that could occur between individual island populations uh, after divergence. So we decided to, to uh, basically uh, to simulate various demographic scenarios um, and to compare those demographic scenarios uh, to what we see with our empirical evidence based on two-dimensional set frequency spectra in uh, DADI. And what we see in the case of Belize is uh, pretty strong evidence for the idea that, that since they split, these two populations have evolved independently, uh, at least based on the genetic data we have. And, uh, and again, you can contrast that with Chaos Cachinos, uh, where there was an initial split, there seems to be ongoing gene flow. And that's not a big surprise. These, these islands are only really uh, a few kilometers apart. Um, so what I think this provides is, is, is pretty solid support for, for uh, three independent instances of island dwarfism in Central America. And I'll, I'll say we don't have sampling for it, but based on geography, there's likely some more out there uh, on other island systems. So given this replication, one of the next big things we were interested in, in taking a look at is 
uh, the frequency of, of natural selection in our genetic data, and whether we can detect some instances of convergence across these independent island systems. So throughout the, the map, we were pretty interested in, in trying to identify and, and really stratify the effects of uh, nutrigenic drift on these islands, where we have very small population sizes, uh, from the signal that you can get from selection. So we took, we, we kind of developed a new approach in, in Todd's lab um, using uh, posterior predictive simulations to more or less uh, simulate uh, neutral divergence between two populations, in this case, an island and a mainland population. And in doing so, we can compare the results of our simulation to what we see with our empirical results. And in a case where you have a population, populations diverging under non-neutral processes, such as selection, you'll see a large excess of differentiation or high, high FST values uh, in your empirical data set versus what you'd expect by simulation alone. So we, we, we applied this to, to our data, and we, we kind of can resolve two patterns, which I'll lay out here. The first being uh, an instance where populations are devolving under, under neutrality, uh, where the simulated data, which is in the black dotted line and the, and the gray uh, confidence intervals, uh, nicely overlaps in these high FST values with the empirical data, which is in blue with the triangles here. Uh, so I'll tell you, this is a, a comparison between two mainland populations where we don't necessarily expect selection really to be driving any differentiation between them. Um, and rather, it's probably just isolation via distance uh, in that case. The other pattern you can see is instances where you have uh, uh, far more, uh, um, a much higher frequency of loci with uh, high FST values than what you expect uh, on, on the case of neutral simulations. And this is what we observed when we compared uh, three of these island populations to their, their, their associated mainland population. So by using this, uh, this uh, model-based approach, we, we were able to, to pretty confidently say that there's, there's pretty good evidence for, for these populations on islands uh, diverging via uh, uh, non-neutral processes such as uh, um, uh, selection. So the next big question then is, well, are regions of the genome that are under selection perhaps shared across different island systems? And to get at this, we, we, we turned to our other data set that I mentioned at the beginning, this whole genome resequencing data set. And what we did was we scanned 10 KB windows throughout the genome in each of these populations and looked for instances where we saw a little frequency change that was quite drastic between island and mainland populations, so on the order of uh, 0.9 or greater. And we simply looked at how often we, we found uh, the, these uh, signals of a high low frequency fluctuation, how often we found that they overlap between two or three of these island populations. And you can see the result here. So one thing to take away is there's far more signal of high low frequency fluctuation that is island specific than what you see across pairwise or in the, the case of a three-way comparison. But still, there's, there's on the order of tens to hundreds of regions of the genome that seem to be fluctuating greatly on these island uh, populations uh, and that are shared across more than one island population. And we did do some permutation analyses where we kind of randomly assigned windows uh, as extreme or not. And when we find, what we find there is the, the amount of overlap we'd expect by random chance alone is, is far lower than what we, what we observe in our empirical data which kind of points to the idea that, this, that there is some signal here that is not random for the idea that there's uh, some level of genetic convergence uh, occurring in, in these populations. So to sum up the second part of the talk here, um, it appears that we have signals for selection and convergence that are uncommon, but they're, they're nonetheless detectable uh, in our data set, and they seem to occur in particular regions of the genome. So the, the next major question latches onto that last snippet there, what are those particular regions of the genome, and, and can we link um, genotype and phenotype in some meaningful way across these populations. So we went back to our whole genome resequencing data set. Um, and in particular, we were interested in, in uh, looking at, at this instance where we had 20 10 kb windows that, that, are, that fluctuate extremely in all three of these island populations. This is likely to be windows that, that uh, are under selection in, in at least one of these populations, if you, if you include the fact uh, the possibility of false positives and things like that. And that it's also likely to, to include any instances in which we might have evidence of molecular convergence. And what we did with these, these regions, so back to our 10 kb windows and our extreme ones that we, we isolated to begin with, we basically looked nearby for what I'm terming uh, phenotypically relevant uh, genes here. 
So we looked uh, within 100 kb uh, on either side of these, these 10 kb windows for uh, gene annotations in our newly constructed uh, BOA annotation. And we looked for instances where we, we had evidence of a uh, non-synonymous uh, coding variant in these proteins. And we also dictated that that protein uh, variant had to also show a correspondingly high allele frequency fluctuation in at least one island mainland comparison. And we did one extra layer of filtering where we had to dictate that, that the putative effect uh, that we can assess with uh, software such as Probian of this protein coding variant it is deleterious. So it's likely to have an effect on the phenotype of the organism. It would be based on uh, bioinformatic data. And when we do that, we can, we can pretty much bring our, our 20 regions down to, to three focal regions that, that exhibit or that have genes nearby that, that appear to be phenotypically um, interesting. Uh, so the major question is then obviously, well, what's in these, these three regions? So I have them laid out here. And I also have these, these genes we implicated that have protein coding variation uh, within them. Uh, there's four of them across these, these three regions, two, two of them in region two here. Um, so the, the big question, obviously, is do, do these have any connection to the phenotypic differences uh, that we see between island and mainland populations? And we have a pretty good signal across these, these genes uh, for, for a connection there. So this first gene in this first region is, is called PTPRS. It's involved in a, a couple pathways, or feeds into a couple pathways, one being wind signaling, which is uh, regularly implicated in, uh, in the development of cranial facial morphology and embryos. We also see that PTPRS uh, fall, or, or integrates with IGF or growth hormone signaling, which is a pathway that people should recognize as pretty pervasive in instances of uh, body size differences across uh, other groups of organisms. In the second region, we had a couple genes that are actually located right next to each other. Uh, one, ARSB, again, uh, uh, has a role in wind signaling. This other, DMGDH, is interesting because of the, it regulates the, the amount of uh, thyroxine growth hormone, which is, uh, is also involved in, in overall growth. Sorry. And, uh, and, and some icing on the cake is the fact that there's a gene just upstream of these two that feeds into the same uh, pathway as DMGDH. And some work in, in mice, uh, I believe, has shown that variation in, in this region can actually have an impact on the regulation of this gene downstream to the epigenetic uh, effects. And then lastly, uh, in this third region, we have a gene uh, called myelin, which is involved in lipid metabolism. And I kind of glossed over in the beginning, but there do seem to be some differences in how these, these island uh, populations uh, lay down fat, uh, probably due to the different ecological conditions that you find on those islands. So what I think we have are some uh, pretty exciting functional links between the unique biology on these islands, this unique dwarf uh, island uh, morphotype. And, um, and it, th these connections uh, seem to implicate pathways that we know are important in other contexts, such as IGF signaling uh, with overall body size. And in the case of this, this middle region here, where we saw lots of signal selection based on FST and, and also uh, measures of heterozygosity, uh, we seem to have um, selection on a region that, that contains genes that feed into a lot of the phenotypes that, that differ between island and mainland uh, populations. So what we, we tried to do, and I think what we got a, a little ways down the road of, of, of figuring out, is uh, the genomic basis of virgin island phenotypes uh, in this system. So I switched gears a little bit during my postdoc, but I'm hoping to eventually come back to this. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, just some quick acknowledgments to my lab down at UT Arlington to some collaborators, and then also to uh, funding sources that made this work happen. So thank you.